This is a podcast produced by Visionaries Norway. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us for the second podcast episode. If you have any questions or feedback for us, feel free to check out our Facebook page, Visionaries Norway. The myth says that blind people can hear things that sighted people cannot. In this episode, Daniel and I are going to talk about echolocation. What is it? Who can learn it? And how does it work? It's all to be answered in this episode. Stay tuned. So when I first heard of echolocation, I thought it was something that only bats and dolphins and whales used. Um, then it turned out it could be done by, by humans. It actually is the same thing um, that bats and, and toothed whales and a few other animals in nature use. Um, basically, you, you send out a signal um, that that irradiates the environment. So um, it's usually a pulsed signal, and there are scientific reasons for this, but it's like a, like a, we call it a flash. So it's a flash of energy that can be a tongue click or some other kind of click. Um, bats, some bats do use tongue clicks, most use chirps. Whales uh, use chirps or clicks. Um, but they're, the thing they have in common is that they're always pulsed signals and they go out and they, uh, just like a, the flash of a camera, um, fill the environment with energy. And that energy reflects off surfaces, same as light, uh, or similar to light, um, comes back to the observer and it gets processed by the brain into an actual image pictures, if you will, um, in the brain, in the head. Um, and then, of course, you choose how to interact with those pictures, with those images. So for humans, we've had a chance more recently to study in the brain how this works, how the brain processes these images. And we know that for people who are experienced uh, echolocators, um, often referred to as expert echolocators, um, people who are accustomed to sending out their own signals, so flashes of, of, of sound, if you will, and we, we do call it flash sonar, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment, um, they, it's their visual brain that processes the image. So the visual brain turns on and receives the information from the auditory system in the brain and makes those images from that information. So you really are seeing the environment, but you're using your ears instead of your eyes. <clears throat> and the images that you're getting, uh, as far as your brain is concerned, are really quite similar. You get, you get size, uh, shape to some degree, I call it contour, or f so you, you definitely get form perception. Um, you get information about surfaces, um, scientists call it depth of structure, so textures, densities, um, what things are, are, are made of, how they're designed. Um, you get information about, of course, distance, position, location. Um, so what you're saying is that with my ears I can actually create images in my brain or my brain will create images not exactly like they would be from you go you know from the information through my eyes because obviously i wouldn't these images wouldn't have colors for instance but but i get i get pictures through my ears yeah basically you get pictures from your ears that's that's that that's that's what your brain is doing it's creating pictures from your ears that's awesome it, it is awesome. It is awesome. And, and there's plenty of research to show, more and more, to show that the brain is very plastic this way. I mean, you can create pictures from, from
from your hands as well. And, and we know that the, the, the visual cortex um, comes into play with experienced braille readers um, uh, and uh, probably with cane users as well. We haven't studied this yet, but that would be my, my guess. Um, but certainly when it comes to the ears, your ears become your eyes as far as your brain is concerned. If you, if you present the challenge to your brain, I have to get around my environment. I have to understand my environment. That's really what your brain is designed to do. Your brain's sort of purpose, if you will, aside from keeping us alive, is understanding its environment and allowing us or, or, or driving us, if you will, to interact with our environment so that we can understand the world around us. And if you present your brain with that challenge, it will find a way to meet that challenge. So in the case of a blind person, it, you know, the, the typical brain of a sighted person will of course use its eyes uh, in, in, in response to the challenge of understanding the environment. If your eyes are missing, but you set the challenge as being the same challenge, your brain kind of rewires itself to using the ears and of course really the whole body to understanding the environment. So so the the clicking, the signal, y you can think of it as a light source, really. And uh, as with light, you can um, you can use light from anywhere. So you know you can use other sounds in the environment if someone's driving by or walking by or if there's you know you know even your own footsteps you those are sources of light and you can sort of get some images from those sources of light but let's think of this for a moment um, we'll draw an analogy with photography so let's say you've got a photographer <clears throat> and the photographer wants to take a picture of something that photographer um, wants to get the best picture he can get with the best detail he can get. He wants to, to present the, the, the subject of the picture in, in the best way possible. So what, what does he do? Well, he finds the best lighting. You know, he tries to mm -hmm. use the best lighting. Or if there isn't the best lighting in the environment, he creates his own lighting. He brings light sources. Right. Or he brings reflectors to reflect light on the subject to light it up the best we can. Anyone taking a picture will, you know, spend a little bit of time positioning themselves at the very least to get the best picture they can. That's what active echolocation is. That is basically what we are, are teaching. We're teaching people how to get the best lighting on their environment that they can. So I grew up, uh, obviously as, as all blind people do, I would use my ears when walking around, but I, I, didn't, I didn't click or I, I, I didn't, yeah, I, I just, you know, used the sounds from the environment to, to like navigate. So what you're saying is that that's kind of like being a photographer that doesn't really have the tools to, to make good pictures. But when you start learning to click and to use what you said, what you called active echolocation, then you actually become a better photographer. Yes. If, if we use that analogy. Yes, you become, you get better pictures of your environment. Mm -hmm. And the better your pictures are, the, you know, the more detail you have, um, the more options you have, the more choices you have, the better decisions you can make, I guess one could say. So. So what active echolocation allows you to do is it allow, allows you to, to get more detailed information from your environment at greater distances. It's that simple. So we're not saying that, um, that one shouldn't use passive echolocation, you know, incidental, incidental echolocation, or that um, incidental in echolocation isn't useful. Every echolocator will use incidental echolocation. It's, it's just part of the... The, of the plan. But <clears throat> if you're an active echolocator, then you have, you have conscious use of strategies and tools to improve the quality of your pictures, to improve the quality of your images, 
you get better information from greater distances potentially more easily and certainly uh, under more of your own control. The term flash sonar um, is a term we've coined that really refers to the type of signals being used. So scientifically, I won't go into all the science here really, but um, anyone who wants to can Google the science. <laughs> but scientifically, um, uh, there are certain signal qualities that we know produce the best images. So you want your image, you want your signal to be sharp and bright and clear and tongue clicks have the potential to be sharp and bright and clear. Um, that's one set of characteristics. Um, uh, and also brief, because if your signal is too long, or you know something like that, mm. then it actually masks the echo coming back, uh -huh. right? So bats, their signals are only about a millisecond long. Very, very short signals. And humans, um, the, the typical uh, signals used by expert echolocators, this has actually been studied, um, are around five milliseconds. You know, they go by very fast. So <clears throat> um, the other thing you want is you want to be able to adjust the focus of your signal. You want to be able to direct your signal where you want it to go. So. The analogy I use there is it's a bit like having a conversation with your environment. If you're engaging a person, you're, you're directing your attention to the person you're engaging, right? So if you're engaging your environment in much the same way, scientists who study um, biosonar, sonar used by in the animal kingdom, they actually call it interrogating your environment. It's an active uh, process of gathering you're asking information. Questions. Yeah, you're asking questions of the environment. And it's an active process of gathering information from the environment by essentially inquiring from the environment. So I like to say that every signal you emit is asking essentially two questions. Um, where are you and what are you? Uh -huh. And the more clearly you ask those questions, the clearer are your answers. Your environment answers back. So you, you kind of aim your attention where you want it to go. And that sort of brings more defined information from those areas of the environment. So you want to be able to adjust your focus, the focus of the signal. And head scanning is a very, well, it's very common in nature. Um, I mean, with bats, they don't tend to turn their heads, but their ears are motile. So they move their ears a lot to be able to catch the right reflections from the right directions that they want, they, that they need it to be. And they also do aim their sonar beam. We've done enough research to literally be able to kind of see or image where they direct their sonar beam. And bats are scanning their sonar beam around and they're moving their ears. So they have, they're multi-talented that way. Uh -huh. Humans can't really move, we can't really move our ears, but we can move our heads. And sighted people move their eyes. A lot, actually. Um, and even if the eyes aren't moving, the retina is moving. So there are tiny movements made by the retina called retinal saccades that essentially result in constant scanning of the environment. Perception occurs through movement. Perception is optimized through movement. Humans have to move. Children have to move. Blind kids who aren't moving, which many of them aren't, and certainly they're not moving under their own direction, are not perceiving at their best. So echolocators need to be able to scan. And um, the other thing is that you ideally want control over uh, when the signal is made. Because if you know, it may sound kind of obvious, but if you know when you're making the signal, then your brain knows when to listen at its best. The brain is primed to gather information from a signal that it has control over making. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between the brain's 
we'll call it quality of response or readiness to receive. Let's call it that. There's a difference between the brain's readiness to receive a signal, whether you're making the signal uh, versus whether the signal occurs incidentally in the environment. So, so when you click, you do it because you want the environment to answer you, but you also do is do it to tell your brain that yeah. now it's time to watch. Yes, yes, yes. And your brain is more prepared. It's primed mm -hmm. to get the most information from that signal that it, that it, that can be received. So those are kind of the, I mean, there are more qualities, but those are sort of the main qualities, if you will, is, um, is, is you, you control the type of signal you make, you control where you want that signal to go, and you control when that signal is made. And that's sort of the most active sonar. And we call it flash sonar, partly because it sounds cool. <laughs> Which is always important. It's always important, yes, <laughs> exactly. And partly because, um, quite frankly, the qualities of the signals that yield the best images are like flashes. M many of our students um, have described it like the flash of a camera. There's like a flash of light that illuminates the environment and brings information back to you. And they'll sometimes say, you know, something flashed at me, like an object flashed at me, or I, I make flashes, you know, and, and, it, and so, when we use the term flash, we were actually borrowing from what some of our, from how some of our students have described the experience. Mm -hmm. So, for many people, um, blind people usually using echolocation has become kind of a myth. You know, you have, you have, for instance, Daredevil, who's become kind of a superhero um, character. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, I was quite amazed to realize that this is something that, that normal people can do. But how is, would you say that every people, that everyone could learn this? So, I'll say two things about that. The first is that, to some degree, echolocation is is something that people do consciously or unconsciously mostly unconsciously you know most people are unconsciously aware of the size of a room for example uh -huh. I mean studies show that people have an awareness of room size um, uh, a lot of blind people have an awareness for example if you if you put most blind people in a hallway most blind people are able to walk down the length of that hallway without bouncing off the walls it's just something that people tend to be able to do, okay? Hmm. Um, and so we don't, we don't dispute that. Um, what we're saying is that um, we can go way beyond that. The, the, the capacity to gather information using a special form of echolocation that we call flash sonar, which is a type of active echolocation, which is where the individual takes control over the process um, to optimize the quality of images, um, that enables you to, to, to really uh, know much more about your environment. Um, psychologists call it auditory scene analysis. You can understand a scene. You can you know, recognize trees and benches and bushes and buildings and and even you know um, um, the quality of a building. You know, is it is is there an entrance here? Or is this a flat wall, or does this wall have uh, ornamentation on it? You know, you learn to. There are some qualities of vision. That uh, allow us to identify and classify features of the environment. That's that's uh, historically that was one of the things that was thought that the visual system was uniquely able to do, it was uniquely able to identify uh, and classify information. It turns out that the auditory system can do the same thing. So the brain seems to be naturally wired to do this. So, you know, in our experience, blind people can 
usually be taught to do this because the brain is sort of ready to do this. The, the thing is, you just have to sort of help the brain rewire to get information from your ears instead of your eyes. And then once you've done that, the, the hardware is already there. And the programming is already there or, or we just do it. We just do the programming and then you start being able to identify and classify information. Now to be sure, um, you know, sighted people see differently. Different people use their vision differently. Some are good at sports, some are good at art, um, some are good at, um, at, at, at reading faces. Um, the skill varies depending on how, what we choose to, how we choose to use our vision. And so the same is true with echolocation. So you have people who are talented in certain areas or you have people who find it easier or more difficult, but it's very much like any skill, learning music or learning language. Hmm. Most people can learn music if they want to. Most people can learn a language if they want to. It's just a matter of, how, of the level of facility that you get, the level of ability with, with the particular skill. So some people you know, are, 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 are going to be world famous musicians because they're just really, really good and they have maybe a natural talent where other people are able to play, um, but maybe not at that level. Um, and so the same is true with echolocation. In our experience, I'd be hard pressed to think of a student who just couldn't learn anything and couldn't use echolocation to improve their ability to get around more, more comfortably. So sighted people, when they grow up, they will automatically use their eyes. Are there any theories on why why, why don't all blind kids start to echolocate actively by themselves? There's, there's some research to show that a higher, a higher percentage of blind kids will naturally lean toward echolocation than the amount that we actually see doing it. Okay, mm -hmm. so I wondered the same question, like, okay, if, if there's some research that shows that, you know, newborns, for example, who are blind, who've lost their vision very early in life, they'll, they'll start turning their heads and making these sort of clicking or chirping noises from very young ages. We're talking weeks old. Mm -hmm. All right, well, if most of these kids are doing that, then why aren't most blind kids actively echolocating? Why aren't most blind kids getting the most out of echolocation that they can? In our experience, it's only about 10% and I'm probably being generous, that do that on their own. So I think it has to do with um, social expectations, basically. Um, you know, if you look at echolocating creatures, bats, for example, they, they all learn to echolocate. You don't, you don't have bats who don't really learn to echolocate. Bats who don't learn to echolocate very well die, <laughs> you know. They, if, if there are species of bats that echolocate and you don't learn to echolocate, you just sort of die. If you're a toothed whale, you know, you die. So why is it that, that blind humans who are able clearly to learn to echolocate to an advanced degree, many of them don't, um, it's, it's, I think it's because we don't really expect it as a society. In bat culture, everyone's expected to echolocate, and you just do. And, you know, humans could have that culture. Um, we find that if we take students and we, we, we place them in situations where they really have to learn how to self-navigate, how to self-mobilize, the process of echolocation develops quite quickly for most. Okay, so... So I think that it has to do with a kind of systematic suppression of uh, the ability, the, the abilities needed to self-navigate and self-mobilize. Self-navigation and self-mobilization isn't really expected en masse for blind individuals in most societies. And so the skills and abilities needed 
to self-navigate and self-mobilize don't develop, and echolocation would be one of those skills. Um, conversely, if you place blind children, or for that matter, adults who've gone blind later in life, in situations where they are expected to self-navigate and self-mobilize and self-guide, self-orient, etc., through their environments, and of course you provide them with opportunities to, to learn, at, you know, developing those skills to do so, they do it, they learn, they, they learn, they learn how to do it. So one of the main thrusts of visioneers is to help people remove those restrictions, those lower expectations or lower standards uh, from their lives and just get on with learning how to self-manage. If you, if you take upon yourself the, re the responsibility to manage yourself through the environment, or if you're a parent and you have children and you're over guiding them or over directing them or over protecting them or over sheltering them, whatever it is, then you can fully well expect that they will not develop these skills of self-management. There's no, there's no impetus to do so. Um, one, of the, one of the first principles of our approach is need drives learning, need drives development. The, the central uh, theme of our approach is creating the need to learn the skills. You don't learn them in a vacuum. You don't learn them if you just you know, contrive the learning of the skill. You have to need to learn the skills. So we withdraw guiding, we withdraw s supports, and we help people to create situations where you need to develop these skills. And when you do that, th the skills develop. So I, I think that the reason that, that blind people by and large are not learning um, advanced forms of echolocation is the need has been removed and the expectation or standard put in place is that we won't. And if those are the expectations and standard, then indeed you won't. So, but, 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 but the good news is that if, if a blind person actually steps up and say, hey, this is, this is something I want to do, then what you're saying is if, if you start to have like the need for it or, or the wanting to, to get to know it, then you'll actually be successful to some degree just because, you know, it's, it's more of a global belief that, or a, a global ignorance of the fact that it, that it exists. Yes, yes, and the same is true for our children. You know, we, we, we as parents have a lot of choice over how much freedom our children have. One of the things I, I, I ask families is how much freedom do you want your children to have? How much freedom do you want your blind children to have? Very few, if, you, if you present to them that question in that way, very few people will say, you know, I don't really want them to have freedom. You know, you don't usually get that answer. You don't usually get that response. What you usually get is, well, yeah, of course I want, I want my child to have as much freedom as, as a child can have. So then you've just opened the door to helping people to understand how important it is for them to develop these skills of self-management, self-direction, self-guiding, self-orienting, self-navigation. And then these echolocation flash sonar is one of those skills that develops kind of as a natural consequence of, of needing, of reaching for that level of freedom. Please subscribe if you want to hear more educational and inspirational podcasts and help us in our work with supporting visually impaired to become more independent. You may donate via our Facebook page, Visionaries Norway. Thank you for listening.